When I was told that I'd have a very short amount of time to talk about art and technology in education, I thought I would use my time very wisely and try to pick a fight with this guy, Plato of ancient Athens. He couldn't be here today to defend himself, <laughs> so it's not really a fair fight, but I kind of think he started it. You see, he had a lot of things to say about art and technology, and he did start the first formalized school in the West. So let's start with art. In the Republic, Plato says, scene painting in its exploitation of our weakness for deception falls nothing short of witchcraft. Now, keep in mind, this is the first school superintendent. <laughs> a good painter, by exhibiting his picture at a distance, would deceive children and foolish men and make them believe it to be real. Looking upon these works, these fools could not perceive that they are three removes from reality. So calling art witchcraft is one thing, but what does he mean by three removes from reality? Well, Plato had some very strange ideas about what constituted true reality. You see, he thought the things that were real in the world were like perfect circles and perfect squares that you actually never see. And even the human body had perfect proportions somewhere, probably just in Plato's mind. Everything else, everything that we see is imperfect. And here's an imperfect being. <laughs> all of us, you and me, all these physical things and physical objects in the world were illusions to Plato. Not only imperfect, but illusory. So by the time artists came around to trying to depict physical things in the world, it was a copy of an imperfect copy. And so it was like a Xerox copy that just kept getting worse with every iteration. Now, Plato didn't have any expressionists or cubists or other types of art to analyze, but if he did, maybe he would see that artists weren't actually trying to just copy reality. Maybe they were expressing some ineffable truth that made them human that they couldn't express in any other way. But as it was, he had this view that art was actually just a copy of a copy and totally imperfect. These two things on the right are imperfect. They, he described them as always being in a state of becoming. The one on the left is always in a state of being, perfect being. So there probably wasn't a huge art budget in the first school in the West, but what about the technology? What about shop class? What about the pre practi practical creative fields? Well, Plato had some things to say about this as well. He knew that tradesmen, they needed to know math so that they were, they were educated, but he says, Tradesmen give ridiculous accounts of math, though they can't help it, for they speak like practical men, and all their accounts refer to doing things. They talk of squaring, applying, adding, and the like. If geometry compels the soul to study being, it's appropriate, but if it compels the soul to study becoming, it is inappropriate. Now, this would all be kind of funny in a school setting. I can see Plato as a shop or art teacher coming around to the students' projects and saying, did you think about just keeping this as an idea? Because then it would have been perfect. <laughs> but as it is, you had to go and make something, and you mucked it up. <laughs> so this would all be kind of funny, but he, his ideas of these creative types led him to believe that people who create imperfect things had corruptible souls, that they were deeply imperfect themselves, and they should have their voting rights taken away. You see, ancient Athens had a burgeoning democracy. And he believed that these people were always failing to make perfect things, and so they shouldn't have any say, they shouldn't speak up in the public assembly. In laws, Plato states, no citizen of our land should enter the ranks of the workers whose vocation lies in the arts and crafts. If a citizen turns his attention to some craft, the city wardens must punish him until they've got him back in the right lines. Luckily, we've come a long way in 2,400 years. And especially with pedagogy and, and how we view school and the philosophy of education. And this is one of my favorite um, educational philosophers, John Dewey. And he wrote the seminal work, Democracy in Education, 100 years ago. And in it, he says, Plato had no perception of the uniqueness of individuals. For him, they fall by nature into classes and into a very small number of classes at that. You see, Plato thought there were basically two categories leaders and followers. And there was just a few leaders, and they understood pure being. And they didn't get their hands messy actually doing things. But they were so intelligent that they could tell everybody else what to do. Now, imagine if we taught our kids this way. 
if we told them that some of them were so intelligent that they, they shouldn't be doing things. And those kids who are mucking around with the Play-Doh and sculpting things, they are easily corruptible. They, sh they need guidance, and so they should be told what to do, and they need to shut up and uh, listen and follow. Well, Plato also believed that followers were in two categories. There were followers that were good at following and those that weren't so good at following. And those that were good at following could be enforcers. And this is in keeping with the idea that the leaders shouldn't get their hands dirty. Those followers should get those other students, other people that weren't so good at following, to fall in line. And the leaders were these philosopher kings. Well, John Dewey also said this, if we teach our, our students today as we taught yesterday, we rob our children of tomorrow. And I work in this place where we're trying to innovate and teach in different ways. It's called the Fab Lab. And it exists in this area between art and technology. And this is my partner in crime, uh, other smaller Eric, who teaches shop. And we've won some awards for this collaboration, this area in between art and technology. And there's actually a computer lab that exists in between the two areas, and we have all sorts of computer-controlled devices like 3D printers, laser engravers, and things for kids to build stuff on. This piece here was actually laser engraved by a friend of mine who was a shop teacher in Crookston, Mike Jeffrey, and it's part of a piece of artwork that he created while we, we were getting trained in on these uh, new computer-controlled devices in Matamidae. And he put John Dewey's quote in it because he was tapped into this philosophy of teaching. So we set up our own fab lab in Kellier, and right away we had tons of interest from kids. In fact, this young boy is in third grade, was in third grade. He showed up at my door with a question in the morning, and he said, Mr. Carlson, I want to know if little things like me have gravity. And I thought that was a pretty profound question. And, but in fact, he had done research, and he knew that our virtual reality machine had a way to conduct a physics experiment to test the, his hypothesis. And so he went out into virtual space, and he placed Jupiter out in virtual space, and he threw a baseball at it. And he saw the trajectory of the baseball and concluded that human-scale objects did have gravity. And I was really excited about this. I, th I thought this was really profound, but in a couple weeks I heard that Nudenunz, that was his name, uh, was not doing well in his classes, and he was failing his classes. And his teacher came to me and asked if we could use these computer games as incentives for him to get his work done. And in a day and a half, he came into my classroom again. He'd gotten all of his work done, and he was passing his classes. And I asked Nudenunz, how did you know that small objects actually exert gravity? Maybe it was just Jupiter acting on the baseball and sucking it in. Maybe it was all just Jupiter's gravity. And he looked at me and he said, maybe we should remove Jupiter from the equation. <laughs> so that's what we did. And this program actually had a simulation that allowed us to do that. We went into the middle of space. We placed two baseballs a meter apart. And then Nudenun sped up time. He had figured out how to do that. And within three days, three simulated days, the, b the baseballs actually touched. So Newton's had his aha moment. He realized that small objects do exert gravity. I had an aha moment of my, my own. I realized that Newton's, in his mind, was treating his, his schooling as hoops to jump through to get to his education. And that was a problem, because everything was going to stop if he couldn't tinker and, crea and create his own lessons in some way. So I've come to see my job as not just art and creativity and creating things, but teaching the creative learning process. And there's two essential pieces that I've kind of boiled the creative learning process or the creative process in general down to. It's divergent thinking and convergent thinking. If you don't see students doing this, then you're probably not getting them into a creative learning process. Divergent thinking is like casting a net out into the unknown. Kids aren't going to do this if you tell them the answer first. I could have told Newton Nunes that, that small objects exert gravitational fields, and he wouldn't have had this experience. I like this metaphor because it has a natural reaction, this convergent thinking that happens. And you have to look at what you got out of the unknown and pick apart the things that seem useful. Now, this is a nice stock photo, but actually this process is really messy. You bring in a lot of garbage, and you have to weed through it. 
So I'm not here to actually talk about the creative process. I'm here to talk about the pedagogy of creativity. How do we get kids to be creative? There's two things that I want, two examples, strategies on how to do this that I want to go over. Enabling constraints and dynamic stability. Enabling constraints, both of these sound paradoxical. Because how do you enable something and constrain it at the same time? How do you have something in motion, dynamic, and stable at the same time? So I'll start with enabling constraints. I like to use the metaphor of a hose that's just pouring out onto the ground as having no constraint. But there's potential energy in there. You put your thumb on that hose, and it can shoot farther than you ever thought possible with, if you looked at it originally. So that's an enabling constraint. The reason this is important be is because there are new forms of technology that make things easier. We all have them in our pockets. And they also allow us to skip essential learning stages. So if you think in the past, a good example of constraints in the past was Michelangelo's David. Michelangelo was working from a piece of stone that had been discarded for 70 years. It had been thought unusable. Two artists had been mucking around with it. One had made a cut into it that made it virtually impossible to make something interesting out of. That was what was thought. But Michelangelo had to be incredibly creative in order to figure out not only how to fit a human form inside the stone, but to make it aesthetically pleasing and inspiring. And we can all agree that he was definitely successful in that. But he was constrained, and he had to be creative to do that. Now I've got students who are sculpting in virtual space, and they can just take these objects and make them as big as they want and do anything they want to them. There's no constraints, really, now. And in fact, my students, you can see up on the wall in this virtual space, could download Michelangelo's David and just start pulling his nose or whatever. <laughs> so he could start manipulating that sculpture, or maybe just paint it purple or something. And that's what kids actually do when I don't give them constraints. So I have to constrain them in some way to say, you're only going to use that empty sphere or an empty cube. This is Owen Wilson, and he, cre he just created one of his own creations, and it meant a lot to him, so much that he figured out how to 3D print it, and I didn't even know how to do this. He figured out how to export it in the right format and 3D print it on one of our 3D printers. He made a little box to display it. Neil Gershenfeld would say that Owen Wilson just discovered the whole lesson of the Fab Lab. It's a revolution that's happening in manufacturing technology. It's taking those bits, those computer bits that don't really exist, and turning them into atoms. And it's becoming easier and easier. Neil Gershenfeld says, the revolution is the ability to turn things into data and data into things. Give ordinary people the right tools, and they will design and build the most extraordinary things. That sounds kind of anti-Plato, doesn't it? Plato thought that ordinary people weren't able to do any of this. But as we can see in the Fab Lab, they are. Now I want to talk about dynamic stability. Now we've got the kid in motion, right? They're doing things we didn't even tell them to do, and they're figuring things out. But how do we keep that going when we're not around? That's, that gets to the idea of dynamic stability. And this is a student of mine, Alyssa Dakin, who was in 12th grade at the time, and I was trying to explain to her some of this. And she said, teach a kid a fact, they learn for a day. Teach a kid to think, and they will learn for a lifetime. That was profound to me. She had stumbled upon this idea that I was trying to get across of dynamic stability. Isaac Newton would say that an object in motion will stay in motion. But as Newtonians will point out, that's only if it doesn't have gravity to contend with. So how do we make sure that as we let go of that bicycle that a student is still in motion and stable? There's so many ways to fall. Well, Lev Vygotsky had, had a theory based on this idea, and he called it scaffolding. And it's that those kind of supports that a teacher puts in place in order to get a student to achieve more than they thought possible, more than they probably were possible, if not for those um, supports. If we aim too low with our scaffolding, if we have students doing things that they already know how to do, we know what it looks like. It's called drill and kill. The student becomes bored. If we set our aim too high, and we throw them overboard without any support, they have anxiety and probably freeze up and, and don't produce anything either. Lev Vygotsky talked about the middle zone as the zone of proximal development, that area where they can achieve, it's comfortable, but they're doing more than they thought possible. If you do this right, you can send a kid into orbit, 
And as your, your supports are not there, they have a whole world to discover on their own. That's dynamic stability. I want to end with this piece here. It's the Medusa Rondanini. The reason I want to end with it is that it was sculpted by an artist just down the road from Plato, as Plato was writing about how art is witchcraft. And it's an unnamed artist. We're not sure who made it. Um, and in fact, this picture is based on a Roman copy because we've even lost the original Greek. But it represents the first time that we think an artist depicted the Medusa, the snake-headed goddess, as an ideal form of a face, a beautiful face, something that might be, might be attractive instead of hideous. I was sent this piece, I was emailed this piece um, as a 3D scan by this guy. His name is Cosmo Wenman, and he goes into museums and does amazing 3D scans of work. I was able to take his 3D scan and make this out of it with our mill. Plato would not be happy. First of all, there's the ideal form of a face that has right proportions somewhere. And then there's human faces that are all imperfect. And then there was the Greek artist down the road who was sculpting it even more imperfectly. And then there was the Roman copy that was even a poor copy of the Greek. And then there was Cosmo's copy that was sent to me. And then I made a copy. Not only that, but I don't have the piece here. So you guys all have a copy of this idea in your head that I was able to convey through pictures. Now, one thing that stayed true throughout all those copies was this idea of the ideal as something that could turn you to stone. As we all know, the Medusa, looking, staring into the Medusa could turn you to stone. And that is often what happens to my students when they encounter the idea of perfection. They freeze and they can't be creative. So teach your children to turn a mirror on those ideas of perfection. And that will expose them for what they really are, just another perspective. Teach them that their perspectives matter, especially when creating art, but even when studying established truths such as gravity. Let them fall and scrape their knees and grapple with gravity for themselves. Because no matter how true something really is, it will never be true to that student unless they experience it for themselves. Here's my first failed attempt at recreating the Medusa. If the bell rang, should I get an F? If we give grades this way, merely on how far short something falls from our ideas of perfection, we lose the essence of what we're trying to do as teachers. We teach children to be followers, and as soon as leaders are gone, or exposed for what they really are, fallible, those children will be lost. In education, the product is not the product. The product is the learning. It's our jobs as teachers to find evidence of learning even if it doesn't present itself in an ideal form. Each one of us is always in a state of becoming. Each moment we are making a copy of ourselves and the world around us and building from it. And each stage is valid and important. If you teach your children this, maybe, just maybe, they won't ever give up. And they won't ever stop coming. Thank you.